All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Good afternoon, Mashan. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from the studios in Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that Mashan Taylor accepted our invitation to our show. Mashan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Claudio. No problem. The last <laughs> two years have been, you know, a weird period for everybody with the pandemic and uh, say people believe in the vaccine or not. But if you were a touring musician, a teacher in your case as well, you couldn't tour, you couldn't do that much. How how the COVID affected you, your your family, your your sanity? How are you holding up? <laughs> well, well, I was very lucky that <clears throat> I was continuing to work through the whole pandemic. Actually, yep. just like this, I was on I was on my computer uh you know five days a week and because i teach at nyu in yep. new york city and also the new school and uh we went immediately we went online to zoom right. so um so i was i was lucky that i was uh, you know at least making some money and also feeling like i was useful and um productive but <clears throat> it was very very stressful for sure it's you know it's it's not easy trying to educate or, um, you know, really get in depth on this little computer yeah. screen. Um, it, you know, it's limited in terms of um, uh, just social interaction. And, um, you know, it's nice to see people. It was nice to be involved with people. But at the same time, there wasn't that real physical, personal contact obviously yeah. so but i was grateful to to have the work my husband on the other hand you know who's in a band called government mule they're a working touring band and they normally are on the road six seven months out of the year and everything stopped for them and and that continued for you know almost two years really so yeah i mean luckily they're back they're back touring and, and working. Um, I'm back in person, obviously, this last year um, at the university. Um, <clears throat> so I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think it's over. You know, um, it's still pretty crazy out there. And in New York City, there are a lot of people that are still getting COVID. And now we have the flu season. So yeah. a lot of my students are sick and, you know, it's, I'm still wearing a mask really? all day. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 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 So, and I'm, I'm triple boosted. I have like, I have all the yeah. shots. I'm yeah. like, I'm, I'm like a pedigree dog. I have all my shots. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Many, it was, you know, Lucky that we are alive to begin with, Masha, number one, number, yeah. number two. Many, many small clubs, small band kind of retire. They end up going back to school, get another job, because if you're a tour musician, there's no money coming in, you need to do something else to pay the bills, right? Yes, so it's, yeah. It's very difficult. You can get by a little bit, but uh, eventually, you know, something lasts two years. You need to do something yeah. else for a living, you know? Exactly, so exactly, you, yeah. So, you know, the big bands... The genesis of this world, the Pink Floyd, the Led Zeppelin, they don't have the problem because they have a lot of money. But that's the exactly exception, that's the exception of the rule, not the majority. Exactly. Uh, were you born like in a musical family? I mean, how old were you when you perhaps began taking guitar lesson or piano lesson? Or, or? well, my mother. I was born in Japan. My yeah. mother is Japanese, yeah. and um, so my mother's side of the family, yeah. everyone is a musician. My mother was a singer. Wow. My my grandfather was a classical pianist and a teacher at the University of Tokyo. He taught piano. He taught. Uh, he actually directed choirs. Uh, he taught vocal music. I actually have some of his his books that he published when he was in his teaching years. Um, my uh, one of my uncles was a saxophone player. My other uncle was a pianist and also a master tuner at the Yamaha Piano Factory. Um, wow. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, they're they're all long gone now. You know, unfortunately, they they've all been they've all passed. But um, my mother always had music on. My mother was always singing in the house. Um, my older sister also loved to sing. So. 
and she's nine years older than I am. So I remember her when she was in high school, she was singing in the high school choir and she was doing um, musicals at school. So I always saw and heard music and my father also loved music. So they were always playing, um, you know, records. You know, my mother came from the tradition of, of jazz and uh, big band music. That's what she loved. Yep. So um, those are some of my early influences. Good for you. What kind of music were you listening when you were like high school, like when you were 16, 17 or 15? What? Oh, well, yep. I took I took a big left turn, you know. Really? When, when, I, when I went to high school, you know, I, I heard all this jazz, um, you know, when I was growing up because of my mom. But uh, when I hit high school, it was the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, um, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, Joni Mitchell um a lot of rock and roll a lot of folk music yeah. a lot of pop music of the time um and of course you know i discovered boys and uh <laughs> and, so, and i started singing um in bands you know in my teenage years so at that time it was it was more you know kind of hippie music really <laughs> you were you were singing uh, in some this when you were 16, right? Is that correct? Oh, I started I started oh. as a singer-songwriter oh. when I was like 13, 14. But I was in a band by the time I was 16. Yeah, 15, going, 16. Going to clubs? I mean, playing going in clubs? Going to clubs. Yeah, going to clubs. Um, yeah, I was, you know, oh. I was tall. I'm 5'8". So oh. I'm t I'm taller than the average, you know, Japanese because I'm I'm a mix. Yeah. So um, so I was always tall. And when I was young, the drinking age was 18. So it was very different back then, you know. Um, so yeah, I was already singing in clubs. Man, you were <laughs> exposed to all the bad stuff before. All you the even... bad stuff, really early. <laughs> so eventually, so you were getting paid a little bit of money or. Oh yeah, yeah. By the time I, by the time I turned eighteen, I. And in fact, it was the week I turned eighteen. I moved out of my parents' home. I bought myself a car. I got an apartment, um, and this was all from money that I was making from singing. My God, man. Yeah. So I and I was ready to leave home when I was sixteen, but my father said. I'll have you arrested if you if you leave this house. Yeah, <laughs> I will, my son is nineteen, and I'm not ready to let him go. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I cannot. I was. Aww. Um. But so event right, like you were saying, right? You were eighteen, finished high school, and one hand you were making very good money. Mm -hmm. You know, and on the other hand, it wasn't any pressure from your your parents to say. Hey, go to school, man. Forget about music. The, the, the life of musician is terrible, bad, and you are not going to make it. Uh, you know, no. you sleep during the day and you work, so I speak during the night, and it's mm -hmm. a bad life. Or no, it wasn't any pressure to school is the only way. Or no, I'm. I think you know my parents were. You know, unfortunately, it was my dad was an alcoholic. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. Um, and you know, there were a lot of a lot of troubles, you know, because uh -huh. of my father. So I think my mother and I think my parents were very distracted with their own lives, you know, with their yeah. own yeah. issues. And I think my mother's main, you know, concern was was we had a, a home and we had food on the table and to take care of us, you know. So, and my mother, you know, knew that I loved music from when I was very young and she loved mm -hmm. music. So, no, that I never had, you know, any opposition to what well, I wanted to do. Well, good for you, man. Yeah. In my case, I was a, a troublemaker, man. I was chasing girls and drinking beer when I was 18. And <laughs> my, my parents were very pissed off at me because I came from a family where academia was the only way. And I was oh, wow. moving all the stuff. That's what I ended up in this country. And uh, I changed when I came here. And I, looking back now, that was the best decision I ever made. If I had been a good kid there, I would have never come here. This radio, this one, it says, 
I oh, wouldn't really? have been able to travel that much. I wouldn't be able to have been able to see that many bands. I have seen over, I think, fifteen hundred shows or something. That's amazing. Uh, uh, and uh, talk to musicians. So I don't know what maybe it's destiny, Michelle. It's I don't know. I it's very difficult to connect the dots going forward, but it's very easy to connect the dots going backward. Going, going back. backward. It's a, yeah. things happen in my life that, and that was the best thing that happened to me. So I'm very lucky. That's I, amazing. I'm lucky yeah. So um, you play with, um, when you, in 1979, you, you moved to uh, uh, NYC, right? New York City, and then you end up getting a gig with uh, the legendary Glenn Miller Orchestra. Yeah, that was, um, that, that sort of came out of the band that I was working with in New Jersey, where I grew up, yeah. um, called Grover, Margaret, and Zazu Zaz. And that was a... That was an incredible uh, growing experience for me from the time I was 16, 17 to 19, 20, sort of that time period. And we were very successful in the, the New York tri-state area as well as we, you know, developed to the point where we played um, the Spoleto Jazz Festival, the Newport Jazz Festival, um, and we were really starting to make a name for ourselves, yeah. but it was it was a funny period in music because the the late seventies, um, you know, disco and punk kind of came in to the scene. So it was a very it was a strange time musically. You know, our musical identity um with that band was sort of a sort of a swing jazz fusion contemporary sound so it was it was very eclectic yep. so if you know uh manhattan transfer yeah, you yeah. know they were around around that same time so a lot of people put us in that particular category but we also did a lot of original material, which was kind of jazz fusion-y. So it was sort of hard to pinpoint us. And we were very close to getting a big record deal um, around the end of the, the 70s, but it didn't happen. And we had been booked by an agent named Willard Alexander. Now, Willard Alexander, who's long gone, he was a legendary agent for the big bands, the jazz big bands. So Maynard Ferguson, um, Buddy Rich, uh, the Glenn Miller Orchestra, Count Basie, he booked all those legendary big bands. Wow. So when when I decided to to leave, you know, Zazu Zaz, the band that I was with, uh, it just so happened at that very moment, the Glenn Miller Orchestra was looking for a female vocalist. So our agent told me about it and he said, you should come and audition. And I did, and I got the gig. So I, I, yeah, I did that gig for um, maybe a year and a half, two years, something like that. Um, you know, that band was, was very big in Japan um, and, it, and it was big and still there's a market for that style of music yeah. so we would we would play you know ballrooms we would play um county fairs we would play uh college venues and you know there's a particular market for that kind of music so but it was a great experience in that um you know i learned how to to um function in that musical setting when you're in front of a 19 piece big band mm. and you know it's a very particular kind of animal so to say because you know there's very specific arrangements when you're in a situation like that so the the arrangements are the same every night they're playing the same charts yep. um and you know there's a director there's a conductor um, who is leading the whole thing. And so I learned that relationship of working with a conductor. Um, and also I just learned a lot about that particular style of jazz music and 
the feel learning how to swing and you know for any musicians that are listening to this there is and i'm sure you know what i mean as well there is a pot what we call a pocket to to the groove and a certain way to sort of sing within the context of that style it's very different than singing pop music or rock and roll yeah so um yeah it was it was a great experience at that age for me and it was you know i was traveling on a greyhound bus with 19 guys um and you know at that time the buses were like a real greyhound bus not like a rock and roll high-end tour bus you know so everybody would have their two seats and that's what that was your world and all your possessions were you know stored in that little storage area of your two seats on the bus and um yeah it was it was a trip (laughs) my god man wow it was like going going back to the 1940s you know (laughs) and you weren't the only the only girl on the band right the only female yeah, yeah which which is you know also an experience Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to know what it was like. <laughs> and then, well, they went from there to foreigner, right? You were the the work acquirer, director, and backing vocalist as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I mean, you probably know more about my chronology than I, I do. I, you I, know, I, after I, after after so many years, it, it's hard to keep track. You know, of of, course, of yeah. what year was you yeah. know um, what gig? Yeah. Um, actually, no. You know what? Um, what came after that actually was me working as a production assistant on the Jackson Victory Tour. And that was a left Ooh. turn for me. That was a really interesting left turn for me because a friend of mine was working as a stage manager. And at the time I was you know, living in New York City because there was a period of time I was living in Los Angeles, but I was in the city. And my friend Jed D. Philippus, he was working as a, a stage manager and at Giant Stadium. It's not called Giant Stadium anymore, but it's it's the stadium that's in New Jersey, just outside of New York City. Yep. And the Jackson Victory Tour was setting up for the show there. And they needed a production assistant for the week. And I wasn't working, so I went out there and I worked uh, with the production manager and at the end of the week, they said, well, do you want to go on the road and finish out the tour with us? And so I said, okay. So I worked for six months as a production assistant um, and I learned so much about the behind the scenes action that is happening on any big show like that and at the time this was 1984 so at the time the jackson victory tour was really one one if not the biggest stadium show at that time biggest stadium show so they had um what they call a leapfrog production so when one show was taking place in one town they were already setting up the next show in the next town. And so there were two crews. So we were managing over 300 uh, over 300 man crew. And plus every every show in the local towns they would be hiring additional crew from that town because most of those venues were were union, you know. So it was it was a a great experience um I have friendships from that tour that I still have today. My really? best girlfriend. Yeah. yeah, my best girlfriend was a production assistant also and and we had a blast. So and you know, and here's you know, here's the moral of the story in that, you know, I took that job as a production assistant. That wasn't really what I wanted to be doing, but my friend called me and it was a it just turned out to be a great opportunity. And the production manager later ended up doing the Pat Benatar tour as a production manager. And he remembered that I was a singer and he called me to audition for Patty Benatar. And I got the gig with Patty. So you, so you never know. And I tell my students this, you never know where your next opportunity is going to come from. And, and 
just stay open to possibilities because you never know where your life is going to lead you. Yeah, yeah, that was the seventh the hard way. That's uh, uh, a very good term. I, I love Pat Benatar. I love Blondie. Yeah. I like many. It was difficult because, like, like yourself, our Durga, Lorelai, Pat Benatar, Blondie, we, if you are a, a female and you're an attractive woman, people, males or tour managers or band will not take you seriously. So, you because we are in a unfortunately male dominated world not just in music Still. every everywhere everything right so Still, it, it, was, yes. been, it, it was it was very difficult it was even harder for you for you all of you female yeah, actors, I, right? I, trying to I, make I, it right in some ways yes but in other ways no i mean sometimes you know back in the day sometimes being female was an advantage yeah. you know sometimes it could work out that way for yes of course as you say i think the world is still very male dominated but i do think it's changed and it's changing and it's continuing to evolve but um i think as a woman in any business i think you you just have to really be smart and you have to um really know your stuff whatever that is, whether it's music or whether it's computers or whether it's, you know, um, engineering, whatever it is, you have to be sometimes better than your male counterparts, right? You have to sometimes work harder. Yeah. Um, but um, I do think things have gotten better. Yeah. But the pay is not the same, right? So the two of us, right? You know the same, the same resume, the same background, the same thing. Uh, you will get paid probably eighty cents out of a dollar that I will get paid to separate. Which is it, that pissed me off because in my case, my mentality is very different. I was raised by seven women in my life. Oh so, wow! Uh, my I four sister with my mom and and two ladies at home helping out. So my older sister, you know show me exactly what the world was. So I learned how to do pretty much everything on my own before yeah. I got married and so forth. So I buy, I have more uh, female mentality too. So I'm always um, trying to get on my, out of my way to help female, to get immigrants like myself that came to this country and, and so on so forth. I'm trying to do the right thing in life. And uh, so I, I know, I, you know, I, Guys are not all of them, but there are many. <laughs> it's no good. So, so it could be it can be tough sometimes. It can yeah, be tough, but you need it to be like, you need to work extra hard, right? To for for so, sometimes and also I have to say, it, yeah. But I have to say, um, you know, I'm I now that I'm teaching, you know, at NYU in the new school, it's unionized, so it doesn't matter if you're male or female it's oh, it's okay. yeah. equal pay which i'm very grateful for you know right good, yeah. good for you so tell yeah. me a little bit about the, the experience uh, touring with pat benatar how was it oh she's she, a very nice person and her husband too is, they're very good people right yeah neil yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah they're they're wonderful and i'm so i'm i'm so happy for patty that she finally got inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame absolutely you know that just happened and also you know she's working on a broadway musical right. that's based on her her music and her life with neil yeah. so that's happening so i think you know she's she's probably going to have a bit of a resurgence you know yeah I yeah every time great. that i she tours uh, i mean you know i go and see her with my son do you oh that's great yeah, yeah. and blondie too i really like blondie too. i love i love deborah harry she's great yeah. Yeah, a little bit crazy, but they're good people. They're yeah, people yeah. Same. And then uh, after that, you did a little bit with uh, you tour uh, the United States and Europe with George Benson in '87, right? Yeah, I did. Um, I did six months, I think, some somewhere around that, as um, a background vocalist and a percussionist. So I played percussion. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, that was the gig. That was, you know, the it, it was required. 
of the background singer because um the woman who had the gig before me vicky randall she left to be in the house band i think it was the tonight show it was it was a big tv show at the time late night tv and she was a percussionist and a vocalist so that was the required uh gig to do both so it was great it was a blast good for you man where uh, we always have to is it I, I know it's difficult right for a musician to whether you you were married or not or or have a relationship go on the road for three months six months or a year it's very difficult for me see let me let me explain myself so i go to a gig i pay you know the then pay by the ticket i i drink a beer or two i get there at seven i go home at 10 i go you're going to be at work at 7 a.m. next morning, right? But yeah. from your end, I don't, I, I don't know if the band, you know, the the flight was late and there was an argument in the bus, you know, if you, or you got, you didn't have a good night's sleep, or your son is sick and you are 500 miles away. Yeah. I should have a gig and I expect to see a gig. Yeah, and for you, for you guys' point of view, it's it's very difficult, right? So. It's uh, go yeah, after night, yeah. and sometimes you don't know in what city you are. Um, you know, they, you put alarm because you need to catch another flight at six a.m. to go from whatever Chicago yeah. to Boston or whatever, right? So it's it's yeah, very it, right. Well, I would say that most of the time when you're on the road, most of the time that you're spending is you're either traveling, yeah. you're you know checking in and out of hotels, um, you're going to sound check you're you know trying to find a good meal um and you're only on stage for what two hours you right. know yeah um so most of your days are consumed with the, all of the other stuff you, just your daily you know things that you need to do to keep yourself healthy and um and keep moving, you know, because you're constantly in motion when you're on tour. So, yeah, I mean, everybody thinks it's such a glamorous life, but um, the glamour is the is just the time that you see on stage. Two hours a day, glamour is two hours a day. <laughs> that's it, that's it. And, the yeah. you know, the rest of the time, it's, you know, you're schlepping your stuff around and, yeah. um, but it, you know, when I when I was traveling a lot, I was in my twenties and thirties, um, prim primarily. Yeah. And and you know, I had the energy, and it was fun, and and I got to see the world, and I, you know, I'm very grateful that I had that experience of um, living out of my suitcase and being a free spirit. And I, you know, for a long time, I was not married. And um, when I did get married, um, my I was married once before now. And um, that person also traveled a lot. So that marriage was short-lived. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. but, um, but I ended up getting married again and I live with a, a wonderful musician as I, I mentioned, and he's on the road now. So we, you know, I don't go on the road as much as I, I did at one time, but he does travel yeah. a lot. But, uh, you know, I understand the life, so it's it's okay. It's a difficult life, and it's... Uh, it's not easy, and especially uh, the older you get, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to be living out of your suitcase and schlepping around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, hard, it's hard work, man. And then you end up uh, joining Pink Floyd uh, as a backing vocalist on the delicate sound of Thunderwell. The first question, how did you end up getting that job to begin with? Yeah, a lot, you know, it's funny. I, I A lot of people ask me that question, and, yeah. and I recently just, you know, had an interview with someone, and um, he was so surprised at the story. But the story is really pretty... Um, amazing in that again going back to you never know where your next opportunity is going to come from so going back to patty benatar the mix engineer the front of house engineer who did the pat benatar tour i worked on ended up doing the delicate sound of thunder and when he heard that 
David Gilmour was looking for a vocalist, a background vocalist. He put my name in the hat and I got a call. I got a call from, from the management. Um, I was living in Los Angeles at the time and David was um, putting some finishing, finishing touches on the record on Momentary Lapse of Reason. Yeah. And I met him. Um, and as I recall the story, um, it was Ocean Way Studios in Los Angeles. And I, I went there. I met David. We sat in the lounge at the studio and we just casually talked. And he was you know, so down to earth and so friendly and lovely. And, and at the end of the conversation, he just said, well, do you want to go on the road? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and that was oh, it. God. That was it. That was it. I, I never had to sing for him. I mean, really? he just, he just took the word of, of Buford Jones and I will never forget Buford Jones, his name and uh, who was a lovely man. And if he's out there, I'm sending love, Buford, because, you know, he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime Yeah. by recommending me. It was an amazing opportunity. So, so I think uh, looking back, that changed your life, maybe sort of upside down, because you used to do a smaller gig, a smaller venue, less money, and now longer, a year, travel all over the world with big venues with a famous band, right? So Yes, yes. My God, Pink Floyd, why don't, like we said, talked before, my opinion on the top three bands in the in the history of music with Led Zeppelin and, and Genesis with Peter Gabriel. And uh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I heard that uh, David Gilmore is a very nice person. He's uh, very uh, nice. He's a real gentleman. Real, real, real life, right? Yes, he's, he's a real gentleman. You know, he's... You know, obviously they're all very British, right? Yeah. So he has that very British, uh, genteel kind of way uh, about him. But he really is a just a nice guy. He is. Yeah. Um, so you know, I I have nothing but good things to say about that whole experience. And you know, it, I was in my twenties when I when I had that time in my life you know it was a crazy time it was the 80s it there was you know drugs sex rock and roll it was all, wild. All involved. All, yeah. it was <laughs> it was wild it was fun it was wild it was amazing you know i'm i'm very grateful to be a part of that rock and roll history you know yeah um yeah yeah hopefully <laughs> hopefully one day I will be able to um, interview um, him. I, I believe it or not, I have seen so many bands, so many shows in my life, but never have seen, you know, the Pink Floyd together, all of them, right? The Let's Say, but you know, all of them together. Yeah. Uh, the Genesis, Peter Gabriel, all of them together. I have seen them, you know, some individual members playing different bands. Mm -hmm. or, Play it on their own and so forth. Let's you know, but never together. So it's uh, it's a good for you, man. There was well, <laughs> well, a crazy time of the there. And you were with, with Rachel and Dorga as well, right? That's right. Yeah. Were there? No, no, no. I think Rachel was there before, or no? Or the the two of you joined sort of the same time? Yeah, the two of us were there from from the beginning. From the so beginning, we yeah. were when when the rehearsal started in Toronto, in um. August, I think it was August of 1987. Um, Rachel was there. She came in from London. She was a friend of uh, the engineer, James Guthrie, who, who had worked on recording the record um, yeah. with David. And I, I think he still works with David quite a bit. But um, Rachel was a friend of his. Yeah. So she came in and I you know, came in from the States. Um, so it was just the two of us that started the tour. Yeah. And when we, and I forgot what the date was, but when we played Atlanta, they uh, decided to film that show. Yeah. And that's when uh, Durga and Lorelei and Roberta came in, Roberta Freeman. 
came in, they were really supposed to, they were just supposed to fill the stage because they wanted more visual up front. And it was supposed to only be for the film. Really? And yes, and when um, that was over, uh, to be honest with you, you know, there was a bit of tension between Rachel and I. Really? And yeah, and she didn't like me at all. So there, there, it was a, it was a bit of a strange relationship. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know why. I can't tell you. Um, I haven't talked to Rachel, and uh, and actually, no one has talked to Rachel since then, since 1988, 89, something. She's still alive. We don't know. We don't oh. know. She, oh, well. We nobody oh. knows where she is. I would try to find her. You um, can try. I mean, I mean, Nadurga, Scott, Gary. I mean, we've all talked yeah. about. Nobody knows where she disappeared to. No further argument that you because she's a, a great artist, an unbelievable voice. I mean, I don't. Oh I don't, yeah, wonderful singer. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. yeah sometimes. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. singer, but but the but Durga told me that um, she heard Rachel got out of the music business and oh, she. Okay is working in some kind of animal rights organization or something. That's what we know. That's yeah. all we know, but we don't know, have any contact information, nothing. Yeah. It's very, it's very weird. <laughs> she doesn't want to be found. That, let me put it through that way. I don't think she wants to be found. I think, yeah. I think she had enough of the music business. Yeah. So, yeah. So then, so the uh, two of you and then how, Durga came into the picture after that. Yeah, so after Atlanta, um, you know, Steve O'Rourke, the manager, and and David decided to add add a, another Durga. person. Yeah, and that and it turned out to be Durga. Yeah, and the three the three of you, of course, I have seen videos and DVDs. I have a my no, I don't. It's not here, but in the, another another floor. Um, have about I don't know, 70 between vinyl from let's I mean Pink Floyd. Wow. From from, from Europe, from Japanese, different version, Blu-ray. Wow. So the, 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 the vocal range of the three of you are very different. I mean yes. Kind of low, medium and high if you wanna yes. say the way. Oh, the three absolutely. of you complement each other very well, right? So Oh thank you. Yeah, no, it's actually a really it's a great little demonstration, actually, because Rachel was an alto. Yeah. Durga is Durga's much more. I mean, even though she has an upper register, she's much more of a, a alto slash almost a contralto because she has yeah. a very deep. She has a very deep low voice, and I'm a high soprano. Yeah. You know yeah. that yeah. that is my range goes very very high, so. Yeah, it's kind of it was a kind of an interesting vocal combination because we did actually work together well. Good for you. And Durga, yeah. she's a tough lady, so <laughs> she wouldn't she wouldn't put up with the two of you. So she will be probably I don't remember, but she should be in the middle. So hey, the two of you stay to my side, don't argue. You know, I'm the boss here, so don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think That's the management. Crazy. I think Steve O'Rourke, you know, basically just said, deal with this. And, yeah. um, you know, and they put her in the middle. So That's it was nice. perfect. Oh, yeah. Cool. You know, she's, she's a tough lady. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, mess with her. No, I don't want to mess with her. <laughs> and then you, so you were, so you were there only a year, right? You ended up missing the, the Pulse tour, uh, the Division Bell tour, right? I got to ask you, what, what, if you don't mind asking, What's happened after the first year? Why you didn't go on? That's an opportunity for a lifetime. Easy for me to say, but I don't know what. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to look back and say, "Oh, well, right. what? Why didn't I? Why didn't I continue?" Yeah. But at the time when I came off the the uh, Delicate Sound of Thunder tour, I was offered a contract to be a lead singer with a with a band called Hiroshima. Hiroshima, they, yeah. they were signed to Epic Records. Oh, I see. Um, they had a, a three-year contract. Uh, I had a three-year contract with them. And I thought it was a good opportunity to step forward and be a lead singer. And 
um, I took a chance, you know, right. and when I look back now, yes, okay, maybe it was not a great decision.